Hey, it's Steve Thomason. Welcome back to my studio. Uh, today, we're going to talk more about the Trinity because I love talking about the Trinity. Uh, but we're going to do something a little bit different today. Maybe you saw my quick introduction to the social Trinity. Uh, the purpose for that video was to go as fast as I could using moving pictures, you know, drawing the pictures out. And I, I tried to cover a vast amount of information in a in the shortest amount of time as I could possibly do it. It was kind of like an ADD introduction to the social trinity, which is uh, important, and, I, and I'm glad I did it. Um, but this time, I'm gonna do something a little different. What I wanna do is slow down, just take a breath. <sighs> and uh, I want to, I'm still gonna use visuals, but I'm going to walk you through uh, my, the Prezi, that is on the Deep in the Burbs website. And there's an illustration that I did that covers the full 2,000 years of the conversation of the Trinity. And I wanna walk through that step by step. So I don't know how long this is gonna take. Uh, we're just, I'm just gonna open it up and we're gonna go for it. So uh, I hope you have some time to join me, grab a cup of coffee or something and let's go. So what we're gonna do is come to uh, deepintheburbs.com and we'll click on the Trinity. And that takes you to my, my splash page, if you will, on the Trinity. And we're gonna look at this Prezi. So if you click start Prezi right in the middle, uh, the Prezi will load up. And I, I've set my video so that you can see what buttons I'm pressing so that if you wanna do this Prezi on your own, uh, you can do this. And if you're a teacher, or, or something, professor or Sunday school teacher, whatever, uh, feel free to use this Prezi however you want. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to hit uh, view full screen. Boom, there it is. Now, as you'll see, I'm gonna click allow full screen with keyboard controls. And you'll see that th this Prezi is is huge. I mean, I've got I've got everything on here, and I'm going to be continually adding stuff to it. So uh, it might not match up by the time you watch this video. But what I want to do is zoom in here to this uh, gray box. Uh, if I click on it, there we go. It zooms in. Now, what we've got here is a lot of drawings, and it comes from a few different sources. First of all. I have to give special credit. I took a PhD seminar from Dr. Gary Simpson at Luther Seminary. Uh, I did that in the spring of 2013. And no, the spring of 2012. <clears throat> and uh, that's when it really cracked open for me. And I was exposed to the Trinity in a way I'd never had before. And so a lot of I mean, my motivation for this comes from that class for sure. And a lot of the sketches that you'll see in here are direct lecture notes that I took in Dr. Simpson's class. Uh, but then also, you'll see over here this book, uh, God for Us. This is a book that really, uh, Catherine Lacuna, she's unfortunately has passed away, but Catherine Lacuna uh, did a great job. She was a Catholic uh, feminist theologian and she did a great job of really introducing a lot of people to this conversation. And what I liked about her book was that she walked through the history timeline uh, from the time of Jesus and the early disciples up to the modern era and try to name the problem. Now, I don't, not everybody agrees with her conclusions, but I think that her historical outline was is very helpful for us. So here's a picture of Catherine Lacuna, and here's my introduction. This illustration will briefly summarize the historical stepping stones that Lacuna lays down that lead to the ultimate emergence and defeat of the doctrine of the Trinity. That's her quote, um, and that's the point she's trying to make in her book, God for Us. So let's look at the big picture for a second. I'm going to click on this. Uh, this is the illustration I did that lays out Lacuna's argument. Uh, so it, if, if you want to see, you can use the right and left arrows to go through this Prezi. Uh, I've mapped it out. Uh, so let's begin uh, at the beginning, shall we? The, the Really the most important thing to think about in when you're talking about the Trinity is first of all, 
uh, we're dealing with scripture and we're dealing with all of scripture the judeo christian story is really a hebrew story it the, the 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 christian scriptures are just as hebrew as the hebrew scriptures um and that's because the first disciples of jesus were thoroughly hebrew in their worldview in their mindset so when we talk about the hebrew worldview we're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God revealed to Moses in the voice from the burning bush, the God who, when Moses said, who should I say sent me, the God who said, I am, Yahweh, uh, Jehovah God, the God who uh, dwells among his people, um, the Shekinah glory that fills the tabernacle, the God who led the people uh, defeated the gods of Egypt in the plagues and led the people uh, through the wilderness with the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. I mean, we're talking about a God who is almighty but fully present in the world with God's people. Uh, this is Yahweh, uh, God with us. Um, and this is the Hebrew worldview. So when we come to this this story, this narrative of Jesus of Nazareth, he uses language. Uh, it's a patriarchal society, and so this is where uh, feminist theology gets offended by it, and rightly so. But we just, for right now in this moment, we just got to get past that, okay, because it's a patriarchal society, and he talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, uh, I and my Father. So Jesus has this relationship, this parental child relationship with God, the Father. And Jesus says, I am the Son of God. And then Jesus says before he leaves, he tells his disciples, then uh, uh, we're going to send you another one, the, the, the Spirit, the Advocate. And the Spirit was not a foreign concept to the Jewish people. Uh, the Spirit of God was poured out on all of the great leaders. And the Messiah was, the, the word Messiah means the anointed one, right? The anointed with the Spirit and the power of God. The difference in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures was, it was more that the Spirit typically came more on the leaders of Israel. And God dealt with the nation uh, more than God dealt with particular individuals um, although he did that as well, but the spirit was more of like a national thing. So anyway, you have the you have this language of this Jesus of Nazareth. No matter what you think about him and his divinity or anything, you have this Jesus of Nazareth who made claims to be the Son of the Father, and that the Father and the Son were one, and that they dwell with each other, and that. Uh, that the Holy Spirit would dwell with the disciples of Jesus and that the Holy Spirit would come upon the disciples and that they would have great power to be witnesses to Jesus and all of that. And so this narrative, we know this narrative because of Scripture. And so the first thing that we have to say when we talk about the Trinity is that there's this language of Father, Son, and Spirit. This threeness, the three persons of God. And what's interesting about this is that for the first 300 years of the church, um, they didn't really like resolve anything over it. Now, they definitely talked about it and thought about it, um, but they, they were okay with not understanding it. And um, Lacuna points out three of the church father, uh, fathers, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Origen. Um, you know, Irenaeus said that, uh, he described the economy. Oh, I got to go back and talk about uh, something first. This term, um, the oikonomia, or the economic trinity. Uh, you may have heard that, the economic trinity versus the imminent trinity. We'll get to imminent in a second. But um, uh, Lacuna points out two words, oikonomia and theologia. Uh, and oikonomia, or economy, comes from the Greek word oikos, which means house. So in other words, the economy of God is how God deals in the house of creation, like the created order in the house. So the economy or the household practices of God. And the idea of theologia, 
of like how do we explain this, the theology of it. Um, the early church fathers didn't care as much about that as um, laters did. And so the economy of God, as Lacuna points out, is, is really the unexplained mystery of God revealed as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relationship at work in the world. And the key there is that they, the early church fathers didn't try to explain the nature of God. They just focused in on how God works in the world and how God works is in relationship, the relationship of the, of the Father to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, to the world, and how they're interrelated with each other. Uh, this is really the story of the Trinity in the West, which when, when I say West, I mean the Western European tradition that descended from the Latin church and was where the Protestant Reformation came and the European churches that came to the North America uh, and, and conquered it and settled it. And that's where we descend from most Western theological perspectives, right? So that's what I'm talking about when I say the West. But that whole perspective is a descendant from the Greek worldview. And the Greek worldview happened, uh, as we understand it, was formed about 500 years before Jesus lived with two key the uh, philosophers, one named Plato and one named Aristotle. And the Greek worldview is based upon this basic idea. It's called dualism, where above the, the, the universe is divided in half. Uh, there are, there's two basic realities. There's the, the realm of perfection, or the, the perfect, and this is pure spiritual, and this is divine. This is God. And then below the line, uh, there is imperfection, which is all that is created, all that is matter, the material world, uh, creation, and it is imperfect. It is a shadowy reflection of the realm of the ideal. This basic dualism is how the universe, how the, the Greek mind and subsequently the Roman Empire mind understood the universe. And so what, what the problem is, is that the early church fathers and, and Christianity, um, when it started in the Hebrew world, it, it was no problems like father, son, spirit, boom, God present. We get it. We don't understand it, but we get it. But once they started trying to communicate that across cultural boundaries, uh, the Apostle Paul being the first really recorded to do this, um, they ran into problems because all of a sudden you have a, a completely different understanding of the universe where God is completely separate from the created order and is not interactive directly with the creation. And so, and God is not changeable. I mean, you, God doesn't change. It's not that God won't change. It's that God can't change. It's just totally impossible. And so here, here's the basic understanding. If, this, this is the Greek logic, right? If God is perfect and unchanging, then how can God become flesh? He can't. Therefore, Jesus can't be God. Now, that was the basic argument. And See, in, in the early 300s, in th like 315, uh, the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. And all of a sudden, overnight, almost literally overnight, uh, this, this faith of, of Christ followers that was underground and often persecuted by the Roman Empire is now suddenly the state religion of the Roman Empire. And Emperor Constantine, he wanted to get ducks in a row, right? Make things in order. And so what he did was he invited all of the, the key leaders, the bishops, every town had its own uh, bishop, uh, invited the bishops to come together at this uh, Council of Nicaea. I think that's my next picture. Yeah, the Council of Nicaea in 325. And the big thing that people had been arguing about for, well, at least 200 years was the identity of Jesus. How could Jesus be God? Because in the Greek mind, as Paul said to the church in Corinth, God crucified is foolishness to the Greeks. I mean, it just, it can't work. 
And so uh, this this whole debate is is really uh, symbolized in this debate between er this guy named Arius and uh, another guy named Athanasius. It's just it's classically known as the Arian controversy. And Arius was like the the megachurch pastor of Alexandria, and he. he he had like the popular vote. People loved him. He was a great speaker. Uh, he was young and energetic, uh, but he was thoroughly Greek in his mindset. And so what he did was um, he taught that Jesus was the very first thing that God created. And so, and then God used Jesus to create everything else. And so from our perspective, as lower on the pecking order of the created things, from our perspective, Jesus is like God and the Son of God and his sacrifice paid for our sin and so on and that whole idea. But that because of Arius' Greek worldview, Jesus cannot be God of the same substance as God because there's the divine substance which cannot change and then there's the material substance of the world which is always changing and, and needs to be uh, gotten rid of so that we can become one with the divine. And so Jesus was like the ultimate example of how to be one, how the created can be one with the creator, um, but wasn't God. And so Athanasius came along and said, oh, no, 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 no. And Athanasius used Greek philosophy at the Council of Nicaea in a public debate, used Greek philosophy to come up with what has now come to be known as the idea of the imminent trinity. And this is where what Lacunia says, uh, theologia was born, like the theology of the trinity was created at this time. And what Athanasius did was he used Greek thought processes to argue and demonstrate that God was in uh, was thoroughly the imminent Trinity w came down like this: there is one essence, there is one substance, one usia of God. So God is one, but there are three persons, or and hypostasis. These are the three persons of God, and uh, so God in God's self is the same essence, hamusia, not a similar essence, hamoiousia. That's what uh, Arius said. He said they were similar, but not the same. But Athanasius said, no, they're the same. And so therefore, Athanasius actually like won, won the, the battle over Trinity. But according to Lacunia and others, uh, lost the war. Because what happened now is you see, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as three persons within the one essence of God. But God is still up here above the, the line of creation. And so what, what Athanasius did in this doctrine of the Trinity, the imminent Trinity, is it pushed God up above cre the created, above the oikos, the, and, there, and we lost the economic trinity. We lost God at work in the world. And so now we had to find a different way for God to be at work in the world. And there was a Greek philosopher named Plotinus, and he talked about these emanations from the divine. Uh, and, that's, and that's actually where we get this idea of a staircase to heaven, that there are these uh, variated steps from the perfect down to the imperfect. And that Jesus, um, that since Jesus is now part of the perfect uh, second person of the Trinity within God's self, no longer is Jesus um, at work in the world and no longer is the Holy Spirit at work in the world. And so Greek philosopher, Christian philosophers had to come up with a different way of how humans related with God. And that created all kinds of problems. And, that, and, and, and thus, uh, s since you have orthodoxy here, then you had all kinds of heresies that fell outside of that orthodox. And um, a couple different things happened. One is that, uh, let, me, let me come down. Uh, I lost my train here. So 
uh, in the 380s, there were these Greek dudes called the Cappadocians, and they talked about, they emphasized the threeness of God, and they called that perichoresis, which is the indwelling or the moving in and out of. And they saw that the three persons of God moved in within God's self equally, and yet it was still God within God's self, above the line. And then a Latin speaker named Augustine in 400, he, uh, he looked at God as more of a hierarchy of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, um, and some claim uh, saw God more as an internal in the mind and, and saw that um, God, the Trinity, uh, that our, the fact that we're a mind, spirit, and body, a Trinity in ourself, is a reflection of what God is like. And so um, we, we kind of lost, according to Lacuna, we kind of lost the idea that God is at work in the world uh, in everyday life. And, and because of that, the church actually stepped into the place of God at work in the world. And people had to come to the church and move up the staircase to heaven, essentially. So by the 13th century, Lacuna talks about how in the East, uh, Palamas was a, a Greek Orthodox leader. Because the Trinity is God within God's self, we needed something else to mediate. And so the Greek Orthodoxy kind of adopted like a, a, a Neoplatonic idea that through knowledge and self like meditation and spiritual disciplines, you could uh, become one with God, which was called deification. And in the Latin West, this is uh, where a lot of the Mary theology came from, is that we needed another mediator, right? And the angels and the worship of the saints and things like that. And not that those things are, are necessarily bad, but they're understandable because we needed these mediaries because Jesus and the Holy Spirit are no longer at work in the world because of this uh, Greek idea. And in the West, according to Lacuna, um, Thomas Aquinas takes the same kind of thing, and he has this thing called Exodus Reditus, which is that that the, the way the Trinity works is that God momentarily descended uh, into creation through Jesus and then returned, the Reditus, and then sent the Holy Spirit to inspire Scripture and then returned. And Thomas Aquinas, his intermediary thing that brought us to God was nat what he called natural theology, that we can actually know God through observing creation. So he kind of took a an Aristotle's approach by observing the created order, we could figure out what the perfect is. And so Aquinas said, by observing creation, we see God's glory and we can know God, but the Trinity is still up there. It's not this idea of God at work in the world. And so, uh, according to, again, according to Lacuna, because of these two things and this evolution over the history of of a thousand years of medieval theology, both in the West and in the East, the economy of God, God at work in the world, became reduced. It became reduced to um, jumping the gap. So no longer was God at work in God's world, like Yahweh, Jehovah of the Hebrew scriptures, uh, you know, working with people where they're at and helping them struggle through life. Instead, God was up there in this realm of the eternal, and sin had separated us from the eternal, and the whole work of God was reduced to saving people from eternal damnation and jumping the gap into eternal life after this life is over. And all you needed was the blood of Jesus for that. You didn't really need Jesus and the Spirit at work in the world. And so modern theology then... Um, through the evolution of the Enlightenment and all of that, modern theology came up to uh, this point, Trinity. What's the point? So the Cunha's conclusion is the Trinity just really became like a footnote in modern theology. People didn't talk about it. So that brings us to uh, this, this intermission, if you will, <laughs> where we need to look 
at the development of uh, modern theology, the modern world in the West. And this is an a, uh, illustration I did from a lecture from Dr. Simpson. And it really centers in on, on this guy, Rene Descartes, uh, who died in 1650. And uh, a couple things are happening. Uh, first of all, we have in 1515, we have Martin Luther, who, who is one of the guys who sparks the Reformation. And that caused all kinds of problems because Luther and his followers uh, were, were challenging the authority of the Pope and the Pope was pushing back against that and it caused war. And this 30 years war that started in uh, May 23rd of 1618, uh, it led to 20 million people dying. Um, devastation. And along with that, during that time of total religious warfare, you have this guy named Rene Descartes, who is famous for saying uh, cogito ergo sum, which is, I think, therefore I am. But, but Descartes was an optometrist, an, uh, an optical scientist, right? He, working with lenses and being able to see things clearly and the microscope and all of that as it was developing. And Descartes' thing was that he, he dissected everything and he, kind of an Aristotelian idea that he, he wanted to break the world down into its basic parts, to probe into it. And if you could just break it down into its basic parts, and you, then you could observe it. And so Descartes, it's called Cartesian dualism. And, and the dualism is the idea that I am the observer. That there is mind and body. There's a, there's a separation between mind and body. And that I can observe the physical world as an objective observer. And that my mind is separate from it. And that, uh, that, that's why where the I think therefore I am comes from. And, and he, was, he gave birth to what we call radical individualism. That I am separate from everything else. And because of that, I can be an objective observer, which is what spawned empirical science and rationalism, uh, which still dominates a lot of our Western scientific methodology, right? And along with that, uh, the combination of Descartes' philosophy and his dualism, along with the destruction of uh, the Thirty Years' War, uh, led led thinkers in Europe to reevaluate the structure of authority in the universe, right? The universe being Europe. And they said, first of all, faith is not the social glue. <laughs> faith it does not work. Uh, number two, there's a separation between public and private. And number three, the, the public world needs a social glue. So in, in other words, if faith is no longer what holds us together, but actually causes war, then we need to come up with something else that holds us together. And it can't be faith because that doesn't work. And so they said what we need is science. And so what resulted was this modern world where there is a separation between the public and the private. And in the public realm, uh, the public realm is dominated and ruled by this Cartesian dualism, this rationalism, where only reason and facts and science uh, are admissible, if you will, as evidence for what is truth and how to structure society. And the private world is where faith and values and religion and church exist. And as you can see here, um, there's also the separation between men and women. And men were viewed, again, a very patriarchal society. Men were viewed as the agents or the actors in society. And women were viewed as the passive patiency of society uh, lower down. They were, they were supposed to be at home in the private world. Men were supposed to be in the public world making things happen while women were taking care of the household. Um, so this, this is the modern world that uh, we inherited.